Yay. Oh, so sorry. Tech is not my thing, especially at the end of the day. <laughs> but you did it. You're here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> it's a miracle. It's a miracle that you even can do this. It is a miracle. If you know me well, it's a total miracle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I am so, so honored that you said yes to this. I'm so, so honored that you asked me. <laughs> And you, you're in, you, you're calling in from Norway? Yes, from Bergen. From Bergen. And the, I didn't realize until yesterday that you're Norwegian. I was born in Bergen. That's yeah. my home. But so you're not Norwegian, but you were born here. I was born in Bergen, yeah. I grew up mostly in Oslo, but uh, that was definitely my childhood. Yeah. <laughs> And my mother lives there too, still. My mother and brother lives in Bergen. So next time I come, oh, yeah, next time I come, oh. we will meet. Yeah. Next time you come, you have to come see our Willander statue. Yes. So, um, first of all, I, uh, you know, everybody has to go to Girls God's Books. That's where Trista is the queen. And, you know, this incredible initiative that she started um, many, many years ago now. I remember when you started off, um, you know, as a, would you call yourself a publishing company? I didn't start off that way, but it has become that. Yeah. <laughs> so, and you are publishing books from her story. Yeah. From books that you yeah, felt were I'm, missing. I'm published primarily books written by women. Yeah. I feel like, you know, if you go along the quotes and, you know, all the reviews, it's men that are always quoted and reviewed and everything else. So we have published some men, um, but primarily we publish them. Yeah. And also children's books. Yes. Yes. I started with children's books. Yes. And why, why did you, tell me about what uh, called you to do that. Um, I feel like my path has been moved around many times. I always wanted to be a writer, but then my parents were like, oh, that's not realistic and we'll never make a living. And okay, um, I did my undergraduate in more like sociology, women's studies, English literature, kind of a combination of everything. And then my stepmother was like, okay, uh, you need to actually be able to support yourself so if you would like to I will pay for you to get an MBA and I did that which I think was a, a good choice I never regret um, education but it ultimately was not my path and um, when I had my daughter it reconnected me to the divine feminine and her energy of um, it's funny like we're doing Medusa tonight and there's an artist who's painting me as Medusa and I was she wanted to have like some photos of me as Medusa and I was going through the photos I was like my daughter is much better Medusa than I am because I was always so suppressed my whole life so I wasn't like able to like rage until recently of course perimenopause puts you into more of it <laughs> like <laughs> um so my daughter actually prompted me to reconsider my entire relationship with um, everything I've been taught. Like I was already kind of diverging, but when my daughter said like she couldn't see herself in uh, the image of God, it broke my heart. And I was thinking, wow, I've actually done her a disservice. Um, I tried to raise both of my kids in sort of an interfaith home where we were, um, I've been Christian, I've been Muslim and I, grew up around Jewish people so I wanted the kids to be you know to learn everything and then choose for themselves and sort of like instead of being indoctrinated like I felt that I was like okay this is the one right way and you have to uh, choose it or go to hell basically which is not a choice and um but I realized when when my daughter couldn't relate to God and herself that I had failed her um as a little girl because um, I didn't even think about it. Uh, you know, my, my partner Monette just put out a video recently where she was talking about like patriarchy is basic as like the air that we breathe and we don't even think about it. 
and something that really resonated with what she said um, in that video, and you'll know because I think you speak, I'm guessing, at least three languages, um, that when you um, have to speak in another language, especially later in life, you're constantly having to translate in your head all the time, and you have to always, it's exhausting because you're always having to think and translate, like, okay, how should I say this so it will make sense and I won't be an idiot? But that's what patriarchy does to us. It's like it reverses everything and we have to actually reverse our own innate divine feminine in order to be acceptable. Um, mm -hmm. So I often, I, uh, I often, you know, I'm a leader of Awakening Women, Women's Circle, uh, you know, feminine spirituality, all of these words. But, you know, the deeper I go into this path, I realize that none of these words are actually relevant if it weren't for the fact that the default <laughs> was so masculine oriented. Yeah, so this is just like a way to course correct. And then from there, you know, we don't have to define things in these boxes in this way. I think it's similar to a lot of young people and a lot, I mean, a lot of people in the field today that needs, feels the need to, to break free from gender boxes, for example, or sexual identity boxes. Uh, but the ultimate goal of it is that we don't need any of these uh, specific definitions and especially around the divine, yeah? Because when you really connect to the divine, it's not, you know, <laughs> yeah, these terms really doesn't apply when we really, tune into the magnificent and the kind of the, the all-encompassing nature of the divine. But nevertheless, like you say, that since the default is the masculine lens and the patriarchal lens, um, it can be hard to even see. And we just go along with, you know, with the yeah, yeah, definition of God. It breaks my heart, really. Too. It's beautiful the way you share yeah. with your daughter. You can see, I don't recognize myself in the image of God. Yeah. You said, Medusa, I feel my daughter is more like Medusa because I have been more suppressed in my life. Tell me more about a Medusa in that, in that uh, perspective. Like, do you feel that Medusa is a is um, a medicine or a doorway for us to come out of suppression or to have a more free uh, free relationship to, to rage you mentioned? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, you know, for me as a young girl, I, or even until, I don't know, I did not have a real proper tim timber tantrum until I was 38 years old. Um, I had it all bottled up. I was, um, you know, I was immersed in this um, submissive nature that we have in Christianity, especially. It's, it's different in Norway, I'm learning, but um, in the U.S., the Christianity that I was brought up in is like very much like quietness and submissiveness. And you, you know, I planned to be a minister, and then once I went to go to school it was quickly apparent to me that my only role would be as a minister's wife and um, not as um, what I could. Um, so yeah, I think that I had to be really careful with my daughter and try to reconstruct all the dysfunctional, I would say, viewpoints that I had been given and allow her to just be herself and allow her to rage. And that's one thing that um, is still, I mean, even among feminists, it's uncomfortable and it has been uncomfortable when my daughter has raged. Um, even though we say, okay, yeah, we want this, but in the reality, a female raging is very uncomfortable. It makes everybody like, oh, you know, what's happening here? Um, and I think I, I watched a video of you where you were talking about with the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> And I was thinking, yeah, <laughs> that's so much to my daughter's energy that she has been. And I think, you know, she probably contained a lot of my suppressed rage um, that kind of came out for her because I was not allowed to share it. Yeah, yeah.
I think it's interesting that you also mentioned women's judgments of it because you know I have been my whole adult life I've been practicing with the divine feminine with liberating emotions with you know this in these spaces that allows me to really be clumsy and too much and to suppress like you know it's a very accepting spaces and nevertheless now I'm 50 years old and I still find layers of that internalized judgment of you know parts of myself and and women as if, you know, it's like the one who can be cool and rational in a, in a situation is the one who wins. Yeah. I remember I was, I think I was 12 and I was fighting with my grandfather and he was really this patriarchal, very rational, very, you know, disembodied, dismissive. He was like the, yeah, the part, literally the patriarch of our family. Like he was the one with the money and the control. And I remember I had this awakening around some politics and the in equality in the world. And I could not fathom how he could defend politics that, you know, made people starve and suffer. And we had this fight. And I remember I started to cry. I was like so angry that I started to cry. And in that moment, I noticed that the dynamic between us was, was such that he won like he had won I had lost because I had lost my control so he had a little smirk a little bit like yeah yeah you know like you you know like that that part here is just weak it is out of control hysterical you know like that and I remember little little me it you know I was bright and I saw it and there was a part of me that decided in that moment that I was going to learn what he knew. Like I was going to learn that level of control because I saw that he won. And that's when I started to buckle. I started to suppress my feelings and went into this kind of very cool and rational uh, self. Um, I remember how the girlfriend, we were living together and she was, Pointing, kept pointing out to me, like, I can't reach you. Where are you? And I, I, I had my little smirk, looked at her, judging her, like, oh, you know, that she was too needy, too whatever. And I played that game for a long time until I realized that that, you know, that lid of my emotions had a high price because, yes, I was in control, but I also could not open an intimacy. I could not feel my joy. You know, I could not feel life uh, because that it was an armor around me. But it was little me. I could see that I could see the the power of the patriarchy. Uh, but of course, that led me. You know, when I also could feel the price you pay within that power, within the victory. Um, I, you know, that that led me into the woman's work and into this practice with with goddess and then begin to retrieve and, and get, or begin to explore what is within that out of control feminine? What is within that rage? What is it waiting there? Why is it, why is, why is it? Yeah, why does it we see, why do we see it in all these myths? Um, mm -hmm. When we see it from the lens of the patriarchy, we can just keep seeing the, that ragey goddess as a problem and the hero comes and save us from her. But if we turn the lens, it's like, what's the medicine? And of course, like, like you are expressing, like when you actually allow yourself to, you know, for that to flow through you, there is a liberation, there is a returning to something that was before we learned the game, yeah? The suppression, the submissive, the, or the, you know, rational and cold. Like it's, there's something there that we as a collective society, we have, we, we left it behind or it went underground. Uh, but of course, you know, there's been wisdom keepers just holding on to that thread and leaving breadcrumbs for us. So it's not lost. Um, but yeah. Oh, so, years are almost equally, um, you know, like your story, they're equally looked down upon uh, as to rage. You know, I had a woman here the other day who said, I cannot cry. And I'm like, okay, look, and she was having all these migraines and everything, which is the same thing. I, for a long time, I went through a period where I could not cry, couldn't 
afraid, I shouldn't cry. Like you're saying, it's all connected. If you can't feel um, your rage or your your tears or your deep sadness, you can't feel your joy either. You know, you have to go to your um, your, your joy is your sorrow unmasked. And so if you don't, if you're not connected with that, all those deep parts of yourself, you won't feel the joy either. And that's where I think depression is in for so many of us. Um, you have to actually be able to feel everything. And um, I didn't cry for a long time. Now people that know me probably think I've always been this way, but uh, I cry every day, probably many times a day. And my husband also cries and he has a beautiful song that he just wrote impromptu about the don't be afraid to cry don't be afraid to be a man that he did with one of our really dear bulgarian friends it is so um it was completely impromptu but it was so beautiful to see them um, do that together with like men that are in touch with the divine masculine that are not afraid to be uh, in their divinity So tell me a little bit more about the project that you just you just completed the, uh, a project called Medusa Speaks. It's actually something you can find on Instagram. Everybody can go hashtag Medusa Speaks. And then you can see a lot of this beautiful art and and contemplation and scholars and, um, you know, that was gathering around this uh, book that you published and 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 um, interviews you did and. Uh, just tell us um, what what was the 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 calling in you that uh, started that. Um, you know, I had a really negative association with Medusa from childhood. Um, I remember seeing, and I had to look it up. I didn't even remember what it was, but I had a very vivid uh, memory as a child uh, in the eighties, watching a film where Medusa was really scary and. Um, so, and it was, I think it's called Clash of the Titans. And um, I, I thought she was terrifying. Um, and yet on the opposite side, I always had like this fascination with Pegasus. So I think probably that tied in together later as I was able to like reread. Like, re I'm just going to just pause you there for a moment and just tell everybody that there's a part of the myth where the hero comes and cuts Medusa's head off and out of her you know, out of the blood and out of her throat comes uh, her two, it, they are called her two sons. We can call her also aspects of her. And one of them is Pegasus, the winged winged horse, beloved, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mythical uh, figure. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, I think Pegasus is a really powerful archetype as someone who's coming out of patriarchy. I actually have um, the original, I don't know if it's not, but, um, as we were finishing, I told my friend Arna Bartz, I need a Pegasus. <laughs> so I commissioned a Pegasus piece for her and it's right next to my front door um, to remind me every day of like, we can fly, you know, we don't have to be in this uh, world we've been assigned to. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people think like, okay, you're in this space now, but you still, I think, often carry it. If you've had a very dysfunctional and patriarchal upbringing, it's still there and you need reminders. I have reminders all over my house, like, okay, <laughs> you don't have to do this and you can choose a different way. Um, as in terms of Medusa, um, we had done, I think three children's books that I had written. And then Glennis Livingstone, who I adore, came to me and said, you know, I've had this children's book that I wrote like 20 years ago. It's been sitting in a drawer would you want to look at it? And I was like, yeah, of course. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's phenomenal because I think where we start is with children and um, it's, it's difficult as, as adults to like go back and reprogram ourselves from all the things that we have been conditioned to know. And, and actually I would say like we, strip away from children what they already know we have all this innate wisdom within ourselves from birth and that's always the approach that I took with my children is that you know more than I do actually because my innate wisdom was suppressed so I felt like my children were very innocent manifestations of divine knowledge that actually 
taught me and brought me back into like my true source. Um, so the book uh, I just thought was completely magical. Um, I asked Arna Arts, who uh, I mentioned earlier, if she would be an interested in illustrating it and she was and so we put that out and and then I was like gosh there's so much here we should do an anthology we did and um, Joe Marler wrote preface and Marion Dexter Robbins um, put in this amazing paper um, that is probably one of the most complete manuscripts uh, on Medusa that is available I mean it's it's really special. Um, and then we decided, okay, <laughs> we're putting out all these books that so many times, um, it seems like people are not reading. Like I am a total like book addict, so I could read all the time and um, that would be my happy place. But we wanted to bring it out to more people. So we did this, um, I don't know, for better. I don't know what we would, I don't even know what we called it, a symposium or a webinar or whatever. Um, and yeah, we brought in um, Lenitz, uh, Livingstone, Joe Marler, Laura Shannon, um, Mary Roberts Dexter, and uh, Joe Marler, and um, just had conversations. And what, if you could this. mention one of the things or a few things that really, that, that touched you, changed you, uh, opened you through these uh, conversations, what would that be? Well, I think first and foremost, the way that she was misrepresented um, yeah. as all powerful women are, you know, they're always the bitch, the ball buster, this, you know, horrible person for being in their power. And um, there's a really um, famous passage, and I'm horrible with pronunciation, but Aline is French, so I'm really going to put this scroll, maybe you know better than I, but, but she said, you know, the Medusa isn't uh, horrifying. She's laughing and she's beautiful. And she was actually a beautiful woman. She's distorted the whole, um, you know, after patriarchy, she became like this horrid woman, uh, which is so often the case. We take all these women, if they're strong, we make them scary. Um, so that's my takeaway is like, if you hear about a woman who's like scary, maybe you should take patriarchy of saying about her. Because... Um, that's what we always do in, we always do that in our practice. It's like, okay, says who? Like, who's telling this story? You know, recently we did one uh, practice immersion, a sadhana around Gaia's oracle, or, you know, and the oracle in Delphi, which, you know, again, some, like everybody knows about the oracle in Delphi. And the story is that it's the god Apollo, who is like the channel, you know, and then he was priestesses uh, channeling the wisdom from the oracle. And the story is that it was this terrible, terrible serpent uh, guarding the oracle in Delphi and, and everybody was so scared of this serpent. And then Apollo came and killed uh, the serpent. But when you actually dig a little deeper, you begin to see that actually the, 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 the oracle in Delphi was Gaia's oracle. It was at the navel of the earth. It was the wisdom of Mother Earth and her priestesses. And the serpent is an expression. It was her, her, you know, is a part of her. It's the part, it's, it's the most ancient symbol of the divine feminine. So actually what the story is about is the patriarchy coming, killing off, you know, or, or, you know, really killing that off in our consciousness, the divine feminine, the great mother, a goddess, and then stealing the powers and make it his own. And then we, now, thousands of years later, hail him as the hero. He's the healer. He's the medicine. If we don't see that, it was stolen. We see it in Norse mm -hmm. mythology. Odin is the great god with magic powers. He's the one who steals it from the Norns and from the, you know, he, he I mean, he gets initiated, initiated and he, he's, maybe he's given those powers from the goddess, but it is the goddess who is his teachers that is not making it into the history books. And then we see Medusa, it's the same thing. It's like, oh, the hero comes and saves us from this monster 
But when you shift the perspective, we actually see that she has roots in this Northern African uh, goddess culture, which she was revered as death, life, beautiful the goddess, you know, that gives life. And, and then again, it's the story of the patriarchy that comes in and not only imposes the more, you know, disembodied, transcendent values, but also takes the powers. Yeah, we see that the hero who kills Medusa, he actually steals her powers and make it his own. And we see all the warriors later on have her, her head on their shield. Yeah, so it's a very powerful thing because in our practice, we also like to then bring all of this within ourselves and see how we do that within ourselves, yeah? With, with this split we have within our own bodies where we actually become, we become mouthpieces for the very ideology that judges and suppresses ourselves, yeah? It's a quite a confronting um, landscape to move into and of course rewarding. Well, and the snake is very interesting because uh, I feel sorry for snakes now. They're beautiful creatures and we've made them into this evil thing. But all the stories, goddess stories were subverted, you know. Um, Anama, Isis, those were the original uh, stories of Jesus. You know, I mean, you, you can see it's, they blatantly stole the whole thing. <laughs> um, and in terms of, uh, of Medusa, um, they can try to steal her story and they can try to make Athena more patriarchal and warlike. But in reality, I think Laura Shannon has the best essay I've ever seen on this and also about PTSD, uh, that she was completely misrepresented. Their relationship was completely misrepresented. I mean, they were sisters and all the things that Athena was actually blamed for, you could actually look at it uh, under a different lens and see her as a sister to Medusa and caring for her. And um, it's not the way that we've been taught like Athena turned on Medusa. I don't think that's true. And and I did for a long time, but if you read Laura Shannon's essay, it's uh, eye-opening and phenomenal. I mean, it's, it's hard to look at it. Yeah, and the mean, way, uh, go ahead. Well, I, I mean, it's just like for me growing up in the church, reading the Bible, and I, I saw the Bible in, under one lens, and I just, oh, believe, oh, this is the true word of God, la, 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 and I didn't have any room for argument, because in my mind, I was like, that was the pure, true story, and yeah, even though I went to a Southern Baptist college to study religion, when I actually got to the roots of it and looked at the culture, the linguistics, the history, I was like, this is all crap and I've been lied to my whole life. So when you, when you look at stories from a different lens, it's really, really powerful and it changes, I think, everything in your life because it also teaches, it teaches you to look at the stories you've told about yourself. Exactly. And I think a lot of us think of ourselves as somehow inferior or less than, or especially in Christianity, guilty, shameful, um, and then when you, going back to Medusa's rage, you do, <laughs> you rage because you're like, wow, I've been lied to my entire life and I have spent so much time and energy hating myself. And um, going back to something you said on your TED talk about protecting our children. You know, I don't blame women for not doing so, but it's easy to see under paper how we done that because we're so trained to think like oh there's something wrong with me and when you that's your base and you think like you're wrong you can't protect your children because you're always in this space of who am I to say something because I'm you know not a man I guess is what it comes down to I'm not uh, in a place to protect and that is like the mama warrior um, energy that is so important that we need. Yeah, yeah. I am uh, in a kind of witnessing in real life these days what's happening, um, you know, when me, the voice of Me Too uh, rises, yeah, through, through uh, victims of abuse um, in spiritual communities. Uh, you know, because we have the last years seen so many 
uh, spiritual communities, uh, you know, all of them. Yeah, all, all, exactly. That's what I'm going to get into, uh, you know, you know, revealing abuse that is happening. And we see it in sports. You know, we saw the whole court case, you know, in the gymnastics in, in the uh, United States, which was just like, you know, it was like hundreds and hundreds of children abused by a doctor. And we see, we see the courage, we see the kind of this voice of truth, we see all of that. But what I see, I'm witnessing in one spiritual community that I was part of in my 20s, I see the, what, real, what it actually looks like when it happens. And it is, you know, it is so painful to see because when the voice comes, yeah, when the voice finally comes and it comes in such a strong way and, and, and preferably it comes through many, you know, that's, you know, gives it more power. And that's what's happening here now. Because some of these victims of abuse have said, I had tried to tell this for 30 years and nobody listens. All, everybody shuts me down. And now it's just too many that they can't suppress it anymore. But what's also happening is all the victim blaming of that these victims are abused are now blamed that they are destroying the community. They are destroying the party. Yeah, they are bringing shadow. They are holding on to the past. Just be in the moment. They are, you know, that it's this. It's just, it's just nauseating to see that even today, in 2021, these, you know, it's like, it's that people can still do this. <laughs> you know, that they can still, and you can see, like you're speaking about, there's a reason why we all, not always can speak up. Because what I'm witnessing in this community is I can see, oh my goodness, just the, how, how it can even be so re-traumatizing for the, for the victims to actually take that battle because they have to deal with so much blaming and also from other women. You know, they, like it's even people who say that now the, these victims are abusers because they are actually shutting down things in the spiritual community that I love to do. You are abusing me. It's so abusive that you are, you know, destroying something I was, I love. Yeah. And, and we know this from family constellation situation that, that oftentimes the victim that speaks up get blamed by the family that they are destroying the family. You know, if it has been abused within the family system. And, yeah. um, so this is not something that, oh, yeah, yeah. in olden days was a problem. You know, we are in the thick of it. Uh, and even if I identify as a feminist and a liberated woman, I recognize those pieces within myself. They are so ingrained and internalized that 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 judgment and and and, and especially then also the we see that also in the anti-racist work. Yeah, when somebody speaks up about racism, uh, other people will go in and say, "Don't be so angry. Can't you be nice about it? Then I'm going to listen to you." Yeah, it's like a sense of like it has to be in a certain way and without questioning. What is that voice? What is that? format of how we think a dialogue about abuse should go <laughs> you know like well, who, who made that up. rule yeah yeah it's basically shut up because that's um, that's what we do to victims of sexual violence and i've experienced that myself personally that everybody just wants you to shut up the problem with that is as you're mentioning that most um rapists have multiple victims yeah i, I actually think that they're my personal opinion is that there are very few rapists, but they do it again and again and again and again, and they have a gazillion victims. And the reason that it goes on is everybody thinks, because as all abusers do, everybody thinks abusers are like these monsters. No, abusers are really good at masking it. If they weren't, they wouldn't have so many victims. They're so good at like grooming little girls, grooming women, making you feel like, oh, you're so wonderful, and then boom. Um, Bill Cosby, I mean, <laughs> still, I mean, I don't even know, I've lost track in how many victims he has. I think it's in the 60s now, publicly, and then probably it's more like 600, if we're being honest, because those are the women that have been able to come forward. Coming forward is a uh, a rape survivor is impossible because you're always going to be picked on, um, even by other women. Uh, it's horrific the way that we treat people and say, 
going back to what you're talking about racism, it's not convenient for people. You know, we want everything to be on our at a time schedule or whatever it is. Like we're not open to inconveniences and that's a horrible thing to look at, but I think it's true that people want their lives to be easy and they don't want to think too much about like, oh, you know, this is happening or this could happen to me, this could happen to my daughter. Um, yeah. Lori Random has a really powerful passage about her mother that she didn't really see her as a woman because she didn't want to fully identify with what had happened to her mother in her life as something that could actually happen to her. And that's something as you get older that you actually have to see that like, okay, it's not just that your mother was like crazy for whatever happened to her because of living under patriarchal conditions. This is something that all women actually do go through for the most part, unless you're very fortunate. Um, and it's something we have to reconcile because um, we're finishing up on a Buddha anthology now and so many I'm going to say women, it's been primarily women who have criticized me, like, oh, how can you put out an apology about her? You know, it seems so warlike. About who? Boudicca. She's a British warrior. But I, it's like, okay, what is more unkind? Watching your daughters be raped and doing nothing about it? Or saying, you know, we're not doing this anymore, and the rapists need to just cease and desist. Yeah, yeah. I just want to encourage everybody to just take a moment to <laughs> to feel your body. I notice my body. I, I feel yeah, such can. a physical reaction in me. You know, I, yeah, to so just take a moment to breathe. Um, I just feel so physical, nauseated. I, it's just so strong um, to feel into this. And, um, you know, like I... You know, like I said, I've been spending my whole adult life in women's empowerment, divine feminine devotion circles. And yet, when the Me Too first wave came, or the big one, you know, that really came into the mainstream, uh, I realized so many parts of me that I like, you know, because we compartmentalize, yeah? So there's one part that is functioning well, and and there was a part of me that know, know that I have had history uh, you know around my sexuality that is, has been harmful but there's also another part of me the you know the rational part that kind of says oh yeah this was maybe a little off but it was almost like i took a pride in moving on or a pride in i never thought that i was going to speak about it or point out a name of a person who done that it was like and then it was actually one person who was one a teacher of mine um i was an actor uh, when I was younger and he was an acti acting teacher and you know I was 19 he was 50 I think and it, and it was like it was like when I look at it now I see that oh my goodness that is rape and I never thought so I thought I was I was proud that he chose me and you know got me drunk and like I, I was proud somehow that I was free and sexually liberated somehow and it was not until that wave came and I saw him in the newspaper and he was actually, you know, arrested. And I was like, oh, yeah, he, like you said, he's done this to many, many, many. And, but then you see that the, how denial works, yeah? Uh, and I, actually that is a part of the Medusa myth too, how frozen us, it, you know, it, it is a protective part too you know, that, 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 that is benevolent to a certain point, but then it also becomes just a, a part of my life energy is, is frozen and numbed into a, a, a past, a moment in the past, while other parts of me moves on and claim to be empowered and free, you know, all of this. And it's just so baffling to me. Like now I'm 50, I'm going into therapy and unpacking some of my sexual history also you know triggered by this whole spiritual community and um and yeah i just want to name that like that to see that it's not like a one-time thing or like no. it, even if i've done all this practice 
you know, when we go into Medu Medusa, it's so hidden. It's like so hidden in our personal and collective. She's like that deep, 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 deep down. It's, and when I start to touch it, you know, with the support from, from, from beautiful guides right now, the pain is like, it's, it's a death that is just like nothing I, you know, thought that I would ever be able to experience and had to experience, or I thought I was experiencing it in my practice. But so then I noticed that I, with all of the tools I have, all the support I have, all the, also the, the cognitive orientation and framework from mythology that I have, when I have, when it's so challenging to actually go to those places, you know, it's just, it just shows, like, I have just such a compassion with all of us, just how we are doing our best to heal and to navigate through this jungle uh, that is most of the time, you know, when you speak about patriarchy, it's not out there. It's in here. <laughs> it's in here in my very own body. So, oh, but yeah, it, it's just like you said, it's the water we swim in. And it's just uh, when you begin to really see it, like I have begun to really see it for decades. And then, it, and then it's a new layer of seeing it. Yeah. And yeah, it's always spiral healing is always a spiral and you always think okay i'm done with that <laughs> and it comes back and it's like oh shit but uh, i think this is one reason especially that medusa is so vilified and in shadows because she is so powerful and you know we can be fully empowered women and still have parts of ourselves that are deeply wounded and um you know, so many of us were groomed as, as young girls in things that never should have happened. And we, of course, suppress them because it's impossible to believe someone that we thought cared or loved about us would do such a thing. So the only way, I think, for survival is to tell yourself these other stories like, oh, it wasn't that bad, or they really cared about me, or da da da. And I think especially as you get into perimenopause, you start unraveling and unfiling and you're just like, okay, that's crap. Um, and then you have to, it is painful, but if you want to be fully integrated, you actually do have to sit in the shadows and say, you know, this happened and face it because the alternative is not pleasant either. Um, you know, you can go on and live your life and you could probably still, you know, on the outside have a great life. But if you don't actually go into and meet your trauma and also say, this does not belong to me. I think Jane Caputi has one of the most powerful pieces I've ever read, um, particularly around incest, is this does not belong to me. Yeah. Because I think so many of us take it as our own and our own shame, but give it back. And then, and that is also from the spirituality uh, dogmas and you know, and modalities and and of women's empowerment is that there is I notice in myself such a resistance to go into a victim place, yeah, because that is like associated with a loss of power, and then we can just skip that and kind of rationalize our you know like but I'm powerful, I'm light, I'm blah blah blah, but part of the process is that you have to sit there for a while and. And name it like you said this happened this was happening to me it was not my responsibility i'm not going to take on the shame and protection from it and then and then to trust that healing is a process it's not something we can sit on the sideline and think our way through you have to go into the compost and and part of that is the victim is the rage is the blaming is the you know is that all of that unmasked pain uh, but which is not the ending point it's, it's not the ending yeah. place yeah it's a process uh, there's a really good quote from james baldwin and i'll probably watch it but he says something like the victim who is able to articulate the experience of victim is no longer a victim she is now a threat yeah, yeah. and that's what it is you know uh, we make victim like this horrible oh i don't want to and i've seen so many women i don't want to be a victim don't play the victim don't be Okay, but sometimes you are a victim. There's no shame in that. Um, 
if you stay there forever, it's not going to be a pleasant place to be. But when you articulate your experience and you say, hey, this happened to me, and most likely he did it, you're shifting from you to the other person. And it's not to your responsibility, it's theirs. And we should actually collectively hold men responsible. We don't currently. Um, and I think Medusa is also a good archetype for that because, you know, I don't think you should sit with this for your whole life and feel like I'm never going to get justice. Uh, nothing is ever going to happen. Um, that's a horrible, hopeless place to be. It's so, it's so interesting when you say that. I notice the, the thought comes, but, oh, but it's not men. Oh, it's not all men. It's like, it's like you know, we want to slip in. Uh, like, well, you, know, you, know, but you were naming it. It's like, why don't we hold men responsible? I just, because I, I, the other day I was thinking about that, like almost all, or all the women I know, know a woman who has uh, been sexually abused. Like everybody yes. knows, uh, either themselves or someone else. And most of us know many. So that means that men must also know men <laughs> that are abusers. Yeah like there must be like why don't we talk about that yeah like why don't we yeah anyway yeah it's a hard conversation to have um and you know it's kind of you know people will say oh you are man hating anyone who knows me in real life knows i love men <laughs> i've always loved men um I don't love abusers and I, I think we need to hold them accountable because I think we have put abusers ahead of the needs of children and women for a long time and I think that needs to stop. Uh, I've seen too many women that I know and love be uh, raped. I've seen too many of their daughters be raped or sexually abused and I, you know, I don't have tolerance for it anymore. I think you know, the mama bear time is now and we can't go on like this. And Wanda Sykes has a really good part on one of her, I can't remember what it is, but she, she has this bit where she says, you need your children to be just a little bit afraid of you. <laughs> and I think as women also, that's that Medusa thing, like we have been pushovers or perceived as pushovers for too long, that they should be a little bit afraid of us now, especially after Me Too, that we had enough and it's not going to fly anymore. And if you come for my daughter, no. And there's something in the myth of Medusa that I talked to a friend the other day about is like when you were speaking about that, that Baldwin quote about when you are, when actually the victim name, name the victimization and the abuser, the victim is not victim anymore. That's like there's a portal actually into their power again. Uh, because we, you know, we tend to be frozen in these impasses of like rationalization, and like, I don't want to go there. And, and we think that that is the kind of, and we put, we even put that in the spiritual box. We think that that spirituality is just the trauma response that now has, yes. you know, mala beads and patchouli oil. <laughs> it's like it's just, or a cross, or you all, yeah. So, uh, in the myth, there's something that happens where that you know, irrational rage, the victimization, the pain, uh, the revenge, like all of those, those like, uh, you know, very uncomfortable feelings, they turn into protection. Yeah, Medusa is also known to be a protector. Yeah, her name means protector. So there's a key you know, that- my front door. It's, yeah, it's, your, it's a key, you know, it's a key that we think that if I fall into that soup, I'm going to lose myself and die. But what dies is that pseudo self, the daughter of the patriarchy that dies and you go into this messy compost pile. But from there, like, you know, when you speak about the mother warrior protector, you know, you don't come for my daughter. That's where we begin to see a healthy feminine. And that healthy feminine is not afraid of not being liked, yeah, or not being cute, or not being accommodating. It's like, you know, and, and it's, that's scary for us to go because we think, oh, am I gonna lose, am I not, I'm not gonna be attractive to men anymore. Yeah, if I go there, but of course we are we are creating a new world where there, men are longing for that too. We are all longing to be free of this kind of sterile, this kind of construct that is the patriarchy. That you know that just 
amputates our humanity. Yeah. Like our, yeah, the possibility. Yeah, and I, I want to be really clear about my position on men too, because I think that 90% of men are wonderful. Uh, it's that really <laughs> bad 10% that give them a bad name. Yeah. And that's not why I'm, yeah. Uh, All of them have been boys. So what happened? Yeah, what happened? It's like a culture, yeah, that they get, we all, we, we all get kind of pulled into a culture where we learn certain things. Yeah? And of course the prevalent culture has um, a distorted view on masculinity and, and you know, all, all genders. Hey, uh, Trista, you know what I wanna do? I wanna just see if there's any of our, cause it's just so, uh, any of the people listening would like to, uh, you know, join in and ask our question. So if you are listening in here, there is a little, um, I actually don't know how it looks, but maybe a little bubble with a question mark in or something that you can actually add a question. I can't see your comments while we are. I will read them afterwards. But. So I'm gonna just see if there's any here. Yeah, so Bibi, she mentioned that, that she would like to see Medusa as an archetype of being raped in a broader sense than a man raping a woman. That is like also a rape, um, you know, it's the rape energy. Um, thank you for pointing that out, Bibi. It's that's also, that is also a, a portal of, of exploration because of course that rape energy is something that we all participate in. For example, in our relationship with Mother Earth. Yeah. Energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that, Lily. And you don't necessarily have to be raped to be affected by rape because just the threat of rape is enough to keep most women in line and to be safe, not be uh, in their fullest sense, you know, because we all live in that constant fear of like, oh, okay, if I dress like this, if I go out at this time, if I drink too much or I do this if I do that then this will happen and even we have to instill it into our daughters because we know the reality which is horrible so then we perpetuate it that way but it, it shouldn't be that way yeah 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 for me to move closer to Medusa it's like I have a sense of you know, like I'm in, I'm very much in the process, Medusa process, I would call it, or, you know, which is uh, very much, uh, yeah, sobering up and like my eyes are opening uh, to, you know, some of the structures that I have been not only victim by, of, but a mouthpiece and defender of, you know, some of the spiritual structures and uh, especially since that's my field. But yeah, it's like, it's very confronting to see it. It's, uncomfortable it's it's like a dissolution you know like it's you know it, you, i hit places of depression uh, you know that kind of mm -hmm. ugh, it's like a a loss of illusion and i know this from when i was a child it's like i've had that so many times in my life and it's kind of like oh but i want to hold on to the love and light the nice yeah mm -hmm. but in that i'm holding on to a kind of pretend nice i can never fully have the the light which mm -hmm. is you know who we are uh, so I'm in this process of like all the death of those structures, but it doesn't, you know, it takes a little time, you know, I'm in the mush. It's like that kind of when the larva goes into the cocoon, yeah, it's like, it's, it's, it's disintegrating completely, like into a mush. There's a period in the cocoon where there's nothing there. And then like, I have this sense of like, you know, because I have personally gone, you know, my, uh, you know, death of my son this spring. It's like, a, I've been in very strong deep, deep processes. And, uh, but what I have a sense is that it's not even a butterfly that is forming, you know? It's like, this is the menopause journey. It's like, it's not going to be a sweet butterfly coming. It's like, I have a sense of a dragon being born or some kind of a power that is like, oh my God, who is that? What is that? Uh, so I'm kind of tiptoeing around, clinging to the old and, and letting go. And then, you know, it's like this, deep, deep journey. Um, but again, it's like, it's the only way I can have light and real love is to bring with all of me with me. Yeah? Like I can't just like leave parts of me behind and then, oh, let's have love and light here. Yeah. While there's, you know, a part of me, the ice cold in the corner, not being seen or it's never gonna, 
it's never going to be real love. Yeah. So it's um, confronting, but so, you know, have a glimpse of the medicine and the, you know, what's, what's waiting. Yeah. In that compost pile. I'm so sorry. Yeah. I, I didn't realize actually until yesterday and I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, uh, you know, you it's so been... much on the media that it's like, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I just... And it's, it's been a journey because, you know, my son, he, he died in an accident. So for him, it was a very clean death. Like he, he was like that morning he had woken up to, and with his girlfriend, he says, I'm so happy. I love my life. And he was, you know, at the birthday party with his friends. They were silly and he just fell and hit his head and he died. So that is not intrinsically tragic. Yeah, It's like something very clean about him going in that way. And nevertheless, it's, you know, it's, it's horrible for us who are left behind, you know, because you know, that's that specific packaging that was him is gone forever. It's, you know, it's a return to mother, burned to ashes. Uh, but of course, his presence is somehow, you know, it's he's here. He's it feels like he's free. It's like, you know, one of the the things that this has initiated me into is also that kind of staying in the wonder. Like I'm allergic to any kind of theory about what happened after that <laughs> or like oh this is how it is and just like I was just like who the f how the fuck do you know that you know it's like more of a listening and a feeling and being in the awe and then I have a little taste of what it is yeah and I can feel him uh, but the grief process has been very very interesting because it's it's so different than what I thought like you know like when I'm crying and feeling the pain it's kind of easy like that's that's a realm I I know, but, um, you know, to hold myself in compassion with all the days where it's just numb or dull or, you know, that has been the hardest. It's like to, it's like a humbling experience of seeing that all the theories and stuff, you know, it's like, it doesn't apply when you're in it. Like you just have to love yourself through all the layers. So it's not about doing it perfectly. It's just, a, I feel that like every initiation like this is actually just um, making us spinning compassion into the world if we can. Yeah, and that's maybe more more important than the perfect way of doing things. <laughs> who, who need, I told my, my other son actually has birthday today. And I told him today, like, because he's been going through, he's such an amazing man. He's like a young man and he's going through you know, his life with such a sincerity. And, and I just said to him, like, who, who, who needs more perfect? Like, you know, because sometimes he thinks, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not good enough or things like that, like we all do. Uh, and it's like, who needs more perfect in the world, like more plastic, like, you know, a, a, a person like him that goes through his life with such sincerity and with the darkness and with the light is actually medicine. It's, it's, that's what touches my heart more than oh now we're gonna be all you know we got it all together i have the abc recipe of how to live happy and be empowered and be successful it's like <laughs> i'm just allergic to it that's, um, that's the western way you know my first husband was lebanese and um, i remember going to uh, a funeral with him in the south of lebanon and the whole village came and because um I didn't know what the hell was going on when I was there. I ended up being in between right between the men and the woman. And so I was next to the mother of the, um, she had lost a young teenage son and uh, his grandmothers and everything. And they wailed. And I, to this day, I hear their wailing. You know, they were, um, yeah, they went to after and wailed more. And, uh, it hit me really hard, I think, being an American, because we don't do that. You know, we think, oh, yeah, I have to just be strong, get rid of my grief and everything. But I think the thing that's hard about that is that it sticks with you longer than if you just, like, you know, just like that roar, you know, like you can really let it out in a guttural way, which we're not encouraged to do. And that's kind of induces a gift also to us, like the scream and the... Uh, 
uh, you know, at the top of your lungs. And um, I still, even though I know that I haven't been able, and I know I need to do it with several areas of my life to not deserve whaling, but it's so uh, opposite to have what we're socialized to do. And at the same time, it's exactly what we need to do in order to heal and release it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember, you know, my my son, he was on life support in the hospital for some days and we were there and, you know, still had hope and things like that. And then, you know, I remember the final uh, conversation we had with the doctor, the trauma doctor, and he said, you know, now we declare him dead. And it's, you know, there's no more hope. And and I, remember, I was there with, you know, also his girlfriend was there, his mother, his, you know, and the stepmother, and then his mother, his, you know, and Arjuna, his father was there, we were four, and, and his brother. And the sounds that came out of us, I, I just remember it to, to this, that it was just so raw. I never heard sounds like that. And there was no, I don't think or anything, it was just happening. And the doctor, he, I don't know, I mean, he was dealing with this a lot, but he did not handle it very well. Like, I think a drama doctor has to be kind of a little bit like a machine, you know, in order to do the work they do. Um, so he kind of, he, he, he got out of the room very quickly. <laughs> but but uh, like you said, there's something beautiful about that too. Yeah, when we, in those moments mm -hmm. where we just take in, it's like in orgasm or in, in you know birth childbirth yeah, yeah. it's like yeah. when you're just taken by something that is yeah that is life yeah that is just yeah and that yeah, it's, it is so raw and, um, yeah all right i'm gonna check if anybody else would like to say something yeah melina is just reflecting that you know back what i was saying about maybe you know, the purpose of all of our failures and challenges and all of it is not to do it perfectly, but to mm. spin compassion into this world and, and start starting with ourselves, with our own failures or weaknesses or, you know. Ah, all right. There are no failures, really. We're just human. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we all fuck up all the time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Trista. I think we're going to complete now. Thank oh, you thank so, you so, so much, much for this dialogue. Let's do it again. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, we're going to uh, post a recording of this conversation and then we will try to, and maybe you can also even, Trista, you know, I know it's late for you, but tomorrow uh, go in and, and add some of the books that you have mentioned um, so that everybody can, uh, can learn more about that. Oh. and also it's the books and it's also a webinar series with interviews with these medusa scholars um that is quite profound and i uh, and also of course we have our medusa sadhana starting next week and uh, there's also information about that yeah yeah thank you thank you thank you sleep well sleep well and thank you everybody